So it's 10.32, so I think we should get going. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your interest in this session, which is on agricultural supply chain management and uh, policy strategies. I'm Özgür Araz. I'm the moderator for this session. And I'm an associate professor in the College of Business at UNL in the Supply Chain Management and Analytics Department. Today we have an exciting session. I hope it is going to be an exciting one for everyone too. We have uh, presentations which are a mixture of both industry practices and academic research. We have four presenters. We'll first start with uh, Dr. Sajish. He's in the marketing department at UNL. He's going to talk about food policies and business strategies. And then we have uh, Marco, Dr. Marco Ugarte from uh, Aetna Group in Chicago. He's going to talk about water uh, sustainability in brewing industry and also in general uh, food manufacturing sustainability. We have Dr. Shivam Gupta from Supply Chain Management and Analytics Department at UNL. And he's going to talk about farmers' uh, distress selling in developing economies. And finally, we have uh, Azaria Laval uh, from the Natural Resources, School of Natural Resources at UNL. And he's going to talk about uh, irrigation system design in developing countries. So I hope you enjoyed the session and we can start with uh, Sajish. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this session. Um, and uh, thanks, Osgar, for the introduction. Um, my name is Sajish, and I'm a faculty in the marketing department. Uh, so this presentation, I'm going to talk about um, uh, food marketing strategies, um, especially uh, the role of uh, policy um, interventions uh, and how that influences firms' marketing strategies. Now, as uh, all of you know, obesity itself is a fairly um, uh, complex problem which uh, countries as well as government agencies are facing uh, and they're trying to solve the obesity problem. Now, when we think about uh, University of Nebraska, University of Nebraska has also been trying to tackle this uh, global epidemic of obesity by uh, collaborating not only with uh, um, uh, across universities, but also with the industry. Now, this is um, a project that uh, uh, that started out as a collaboration between University of Nebraska and a university in Turkey. And uh, essentially the focus was on understanding uh, childhood obesity and uh, the role of uh, uh, obesity and BMI. Now, essentially we wanted to build on the data that was collected uh, in an emerging country and use that as a basis to build a um, build a model which can help understand how firms should adapt their strategies in the context where um, uh, policy interventions are also taking place um, and uh, also in the context where uh, consumers perceptions are evolving over time so uh, this was a, um, this is basically building on what is known as the COSA project. The COSA project is the childhood obesity uh, study done in Ankara. And this was the collaboration between uh, University of Nebraska and uh, Hasatep uh, University in Ankara, Turkey. Now, it's fairly clear that because of this obesity epidemic, uh, uh, there are uh, two types of, um, uh, two things that are happening. One, consumers are becoming more health conscious, which can be seen in how um, the 100 calorie packs have become much more popular, and consumers are also rationing their purchase of uh, wise goods. Uh, from a policy perspective, one, co one can see that there is uh, some sort of restrictions on advertising that is being placed um, on junk foods as well as higher taxes that are being imposed by government as well as uh, policy makers on, um, uh, on foods and drinks which are uh, unhealthy in, in some sense. 
Now, in response to this change in uh, consumers' uh, focus towards purchasing more healthy alternatives, as well as uh, in terms of these government interventions, uh, firms have also tried to adapt their own strategies. Now, we see examples of consumer packaged goods companies trying to uh, move towards more healthy alternatives. So rather than offering unhealthy uh, stuff to consumers, they are trying to move towards offering more healthier alternatives. So the question then becomes, um, what sort of changes in product quality should firms be offering to consumers, given that consumer uh, consumers are moving towards more healthy alternatives and there is also some sort of uh, policy interventions that are being uh, that are being set by uh, government agencies in terms of increasing taxation for junk foods and uh, uh, banning on advertising of uh, uh, of unhealthy products so um, essentially what we thought was we wanted to integrate everything into a uh, fairly general framework. So we wanted to study how uh, market mechanism factors uh, like uh, social welfare or uh, taxation influence public policy initiatives in terms of uh, how uh, public perception of uh, uh, obesity policies uh, are uh, generated and how that influence firms strategic decisions in terms of uh, what sort of quality to offer what prices to charge uh, how much should be the level of uh, um, social welfare and what level of advertising to uh, have uh, for for their products that they're marketing to consumers so we are using the public policy um, to generate the consumer utility framework which in turn influences the firm's marketing strategies and which itself is influenced by the market mechanism factors so you can see this is a fairly complex problem which we are trying to analyze using a mathematical framework and hopefully we are able to come up with some sort of normative normative solutions which can uh, guide firms in deciding their marketing strategies. So uh, broadly speaking, when we think about our research question, what we are trying to do here is to build an analytical model. So it's a game theory model which is trying to uh, understand what sort of competitive strategies should firms follow. Okay? Uh, in, in the context where um, public policy initiatives are being undertaken and consumer perceptions is moving towards more health conscious products. And so we wanted to derive some sort of insights on the interaction between firm strategies and these uh, public policy initiatives. Uh, so broadly speaking, um, the question that we are trying to address here is, given that these public policy initiatives differ across countries, uh, what sort of um, uh, insights can we get in terms of what firms should do in such, uh, such, such markets. So more specifically, when we look at it, we are trying to understand uh, a firm's uh, product differentiation strategies in terms of should they offer more differentiated offerings or should they offer less differentiated offerings? Um, what is the role of these policy interventions on uh, pricing decisions of firms? Uh, how does it impact uh, uh, firms' profitability? How does it impacts, uh, impact firm, uh, uh, firms' uh, profits as well as consumer welfare, which uh, together uh, determines the social welfare? Now, there has been some work which has been done in the academic literature on um, firm strategies in the health domain. Um, there is uh, papers which have looked at uh, how um, uh, how small packages can improve firm profitability. There has also been some work which has looked at how supersizing as a strategy can improve uh, profitability by allowing firms to price discriminate among consumers. And then there is also some work which has looked at how selective taxation mechanisms can be more profitable, uh, especially if the higher taxes are imposed on junk foods. So uh, in, order to, in order to help us come up with a uh, consumer utility framework, uh, we utilized the survey data that was collected uh, in Turkey. And so this was a survey that was based on um, uh, surveying not only uh, children but also uh, parents. and. Uh, Using this study, we were able to understand how consumer perceptions are um, 
how consumer perceptions uh, are there for advertising of junk foods as well as uh, consumers perceptions for taxation for uh, junk food products so what we can see in the data here is that uh, uh, more and more consumers agree with the idea that junk food needs to be taxed at a higher rate and uh, also the fact that a uh, uh, lot of consumers agree with the fact that uh, uh, the focus should move towards um, advertising of healthful products and uh, advertising of junk foods need to be uh, uh, limited to some extent so we want to uh, so at least that's what the survey seems to indicate. So what uh, we tried to do was to integrate this information into the consumer utility framework, uh, taking into account the fact that if uh, junk, f if you make, uh, if firms try and ma uh, make uh, unhealthy alternatives, then uh, uh, consumer utility does go down if they are being marketed to consumers. And there is also the effect of taxation in the sense that consumers do like the idea that junk food need to be taxed at a higher rate. So we formulate a consumer utility framework where uh, there is some basic utility that consumers get by buying a product, so which is based on the perception of value. So there is some quality and there is a price that they pay. And then there are uh, two additional components of utility that we consider. One is the fact that uh, uh, healthful messaging generates some positive utility, especially for higher quality products. And secondly, uh, the fact that uh, when we think about taxation, there is some disutility associated with taxation. Taxation has two effects in some sense. One, that it increases the prices that consumers have to pay. And secondly, what it does is, uh, uh, because if government is going to tax unhealthy alternatives at a higher rate, then there is a greater disutility that consumers get because of uh, uh, taxation of unhealthy alternatives. So uh, we also recognize that consumers are heterogeneous in how these policy interventions impact their utility. So to build this analytical framework, we use a vertical differentiation framework. Um, vertical differentiation framework by uh, definition means that uh, when th the two products are available at the same price, there is consumers, uh, uh, consumers do prefer one product uh, much more over the other product. Okay? So one way of thinking about it is that, uh, 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 one way of looking at this is, at identical prices, there is a strong preference for one product over another product. So we consider two models, uh, one where um, the uh, consumer sensitivity to healthfulness messaging as well as taxation is more uniformly distributed, and then a second model where we look at the consumer sensitivity to be uh, much more skewed towards uh, more qu uh, quality conscious uh, dimension. And so we look at firms' decisions in terms of um, what quality to offer, what prices to charge, and then we solve for the equilibrium by backward induction. So uh, let me highlight the main results that we have uh, in the interest of time. Um, we look at results in terms of three main parameters. One is uh, how much is the Im importance associated with healthfulness messaging? Uh, how much is, what is the role of taxation? And finally, what is the extent of skewness of consumer distribution towards more uh, healthful products? And we look in terms of three outcome parameters. One is um, uh, extent of product differentiation, uh, what's the impact on profits, and what's the impact on social welfare? So as you can see in these pictures, there are these nonlinear effects, okay? So in terms of the results, what can we see? One uh, is that uh, when we think about these kind of markets, product differentiation actually increases as the importance of healthful messaging becomes, uh, becomes relevant to consumers. One way of looking at it is that uh, when healthful messaging is important, both firms improve quality, but the higher quality firm improves quality to a greater extent. And so there is a polarization effect whereby product differentiation is higher. We also see that there is a uh, moderating role of healthfulness messaging on taxation. Because when we look at taxation, there are two effects. If you increase taxes, 
then uh, it induces firms to increase quality because uh, it's the junk food which is getting taxed. So each firm has an incentive to make higher quality products. So that's the direct effect. But uh, as they make higher quality products, they also increase prices, which uh, uh, induces firms to lower quality. So there is this direct effect as well as the indirect effect. And uh, what we see here is that as the importance of healthfulness messaging increases, the indirect effect starts dominating. As the consumers become more skewed, then um, higher quality product also reduces product differentiation. Okay. Now, what happens in terms of profits? Again, there is these nonlinear effects that we see. Uh, the main sort of message that we get from these results is that uh, um, as uh, consumers as importance of healthfulness messaging increases among consumers, firm profits actually increase. So firms are actually better off in such a scenario as long as the cost parameter is low. Uh, cost of advertising of, um, of uh, these healthful products to consumers. We also see this moderating effect of uh, healthfulness messaging on taxation uh, because one can kind of imagine the scenario where increasing taxes actually lowers firm profits, but what we are able to show is that that only happens when healthfulness messaging is uh, more important to consumers. When healthfulness messaging is low, what we can see is that actually uh, increasing taxes can have a positive impact on profits. And then um, increase in skewness has a uh, uh, leads to a reduction of profits, and that happens primarily because product differentiation goes down. In terms of social welfare, uh, the main sort of message is that uh, when we look at uh, uh, importance of healthfulness messaging, there is a non-monotonic relationship. So for low importance of healthfulness messaging, uh, social welfare goes up, but as it increases further, social welfare goes down. Uh, as taxation increases, social welfare is uh, 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 going down, uh, and when consumers are becoming more skewed towards health conscious uh, uh, preferences, then what we see is that social welfare increases. Now the main sort of message that we get from these results is the following, that each of these policy initiatives that firms can take, or firms as well as governments can take, in terms of uh, you know, making uh, messaging relevant to consumers for healthy products, or uh, increasing taxation on unhealthy alternatives, or consumers themselves uh, becoming more health conscious, all of these things by itself have uh, benefits in terms of increasing social welfare, but when they combine together, then it is possible that social welfare go down. So overall, each of these policies have a beneficial effect on uh, social welfare, but integrated together, they can have a um, counterintuitive effect whereby the social welfare can actually go down. So just to conclude, our model provides some sort of normative predictions in terms of uh, what firms need to do in such markets in terms of what quality to offer at what prices to consumers. Uh, given that uh, underlying consumer characteristics and uh, um, are changing as well as uh, governments are instituting new policies. So we study the effect of uh, importance of healthfulness messaging and taxation on um, quality characteristics in terms of product differentiation, firm profits, and on social welfare. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, any questions, feel free to ask. Is this on? Is this on? Okay. I'm used to just yelling. Uh, so one of your one of your factors had to do with perception, and maybe I missed the part that you were talking about. Um, what kind of questions did you ask on?
Is that still on? Oh, it is. Okay. So one of your questions, <laughs> third time. Uh, so perception. Uh, can you just quickly say what kind of questions you asked about perception? Uh, was it just about the healthiness of the food, or was it an impact of this food on the environment? So, uh, so the questions were based on um, uh, perceptions about healthfulness messaging. So uh, advertisements. So should junk food be advertised to children, for example? Okay. And uh, uh, on, the, on, the policy. on the policies. So the questions are: Are you supporting ed, uh, banning the unhealthy food advertisements? Okay. So it was just a. Th there, there wasn't anything more in depth in terms of uh, the perception that this type of food is more organic, more green, better for the environment. No. There was. It was just about the healthiness. So, because our focus here has been on uh, two things. One is uh, role of uh, how consumers perceive taxes on junk food and uh, how consumers perceive advertising of junk products. So, what we see is that a lot of consumers seem to agree with the idea that uh, um, junk food should be taxed at a higher rate. And what we also see is that uh, consumers agree, strongly agree with the idea that uh, um, advertising of junk products need to be uh, uh, reduced to some extent. So we had multiple survey questions which focused on whether uh, consumers agree with this fact or not. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just wondering if healthiness also had to do with healthiness for the environment. Okay. Okay, any other questions? No more questions? Okay, th thank you, Sajj, again, and we can move to next presenter, Dr. Marco Ugarte. Good morning, everybody. We'll, we're going to set the, the slides. Uh, or, yeah, maybe if it's not the right order, we can switch any time, no worries. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Yeah, yeah, I think it's coming. Oh, okay. <coughs> Hello everyone. Um, so I'm uh, also an assistant professor at, uh, uh, in the supply chain group at in the College of Business. I'm going to present my paper on distress selling by farmers in developing countries. So just to give you a brief overview, uh, many countries around the world offer a variety of support programs to help their farmers. Uh, one of the most commonly used program is is one where they they provide an attractive and guaranteed price at which the government agrees to purchase the crop from the farmers. Such programs are offered because of mainly two reasons. First, to protect the farmers from fluctuating and low market prices. And second, to uh, incentivize producing such crops so that they can feed the economically weak segment of the population at subsidized prices. Now, <clears throat> in spite of the surety of this, uh, this support price, Farmers, it has been observed that farmers are selling their produce at prices much lower than the support price. This practice is referred as distress selling and it has been observed mainly in developing countries. So that's why my, my talk is going to focus mostly on uh, in the context of developing countries. So these, uh, uh, 
these uh, so this practice of distress selling has been reported widely in the media of these countries so here i have uh, provided a snapshot of uh, some media coverage on distress selling in india and as you can see from the headlines um, maybe they're not that visible at the back but essentially what's being there in the headlines is that they are reporting that farmers are selling their produce at prices much much lower than the support price offered by the government a similar practice has been observed in other countries as well including bangladesh pakistan and other countries in in the globe so let me after a bumper harvest of paddy it is distress sale for farmers in andhra pradesh from jagan mohan reddy to chandra babu naidu everyone is talking on behalf of farmers the government also concedes there is a crisis and yet farmers are being offered no options with ban on export no storage space and poor fci's procurement there are they are at the mercy of traders farmers across andhra pradesh are facing this dilemma an estimated 120 lakh tons of paddy was harvested this rabi season hardly 5 lakh tons has been procured by the fci and state government with no storage space not the financial muscle to hold on to stocks farmers are pushed towards distress sale they are getting less than 850 rupees as against the minimum support price of 1030 rupees so <clears throat> basically the message given in the video is summarized here uh, they are reporting that farmers are engaging in this practice of distress selling where they are selling the produce at uh, prices 15 to 20% lower than the support price offered by the government and they have also cited some of the main reasons behind this practice for example they have cited the poor government uh, procurement system uh, lack of storage space and lack of financial muscle to hold on to the produce by farmers so we take these uh, uh, these factors into account and let's talk about them in more detail so the first main reason is the limited and uncertain procurement capacity of the government so typically in these countries to facilitate procurement uh, government has opened various procurement centers and farmers are expected to go to those centers to sell their produce uh the transactions happening at these centers are so slow because they always they often involve a labor intensive job such as sorting weighing and uh, uh, grading all the grains and produce so that's why um the the amount of produce that a government can purchase from farmers on any given day is limited it's limited by its capacity the capacity is uncertain also uh, due to the following reasons weather conditions often disrupt uh, operations at the centers many of these operations are open ended like they don't they are not in closed uh, closed space so if the weather is bad it's going to affect the procurement operations um sometimes the resources that are used for these operations are limited and uncertain for example they use uh, gunny bags to store uh, the produce brought by the farmers and often these gunny bags are out of stock so that basically limits uh, how much they can procure some of the grains that are procured at the centers are also transported to uh, central warehouses and from there to different parts of the country so any disruption in this transportation network also affects the procurement happening at those procurement centers so the all these reasons basically point out that uh, that even though the government has guaranteed procurement from farmers on any given day it can only purchase a limited amount and beforehand it is not certain how much that amount will be the second main reason is specifically for countries which are developing the farmers have a very small uh, uh small uh, area to till and uh, they they do not have the assets or the um the ability to get affordable loans from banks many times many of these countries even lack infrastructure for banking that also adds on to the difficulty of getting affordable loans so in the in the presence of such situations farmers often rely on private money lenders who exploit this situation by providing hassle free loans but at very very high interest rates we have we have evidence that many times these interest rates vary from 20 to as much as 60% annually uh the third main reason is that um if the farmers wait 
uh, for the opportunity to, to sell to the government they have to hold on to their produce in a cost effective manner so that the spoilage is the least right that also adds to another friction in terms of holding that produce now in the past governments have uh, many uh, many of these governments have realized this practice of distress selling and it is their agenda to reduce this practice so that is why they have come up with different policies that can help reduce this practice uh, in this slide i am talking about some of the some of the policies that have been rolled out by government of india but similar policies exist in other countries as well so for example the first policy talks about a uh, private entrepreneurs guarantee scheme in 2008 which basically invites public and private entities to build covered warehouses to improve procurement capacity so as you can see this policy is specifically aimed at improving the procurement capacity of the government which is one of the main reasons behind distress selling the second uh, policy is negotiable warehouse receipts in 2010 which uh, basically provides a receipt to farmers for depositing their produce in these warehouses such receipts can be used as collateral by the farmers to get loans from the bank so as i said earlier these farmers do not have assets so these receipts provide them a way to use as a collateral to get loans even though they don't have any asset right so this policy specifically aims at making the loans more affordable to farmers and finally the one in 2015 basically invites private agencies to uh, facilitate procurement of food grains from these farmers in these procurement centers again aimed at improving the procurement capacity of the government now what is not clear um, until our paper is how how these policies fare with each other so government typically have limited budget they cannot just spend uh, infinite amount of money on every possible policy therefore they have to find out uh, which policy will have the largest impact on the practice of distress selling so that is where our paper comes in our goal here is to build a tractable model that can uh, uh, that can determine how farmers are going to make decisions of their produce of selling their produce whether they should sell to the government or whether they should sell to outside traders uh, for prices much lower than the support price given these farmers decisions then we can analyze how these different public policies uh, impact distress sales okay so how we do that we basically build a um a analytical model and uh, we use that model to generate quantitative insights Uh, on the practice of distress selling so i'm going to briefly talk about the model i am not going to go into into the details of the model due to the time constraint um so we basically assume a farming community which i will denote as f who sells some quantity q of a produce over a finite horizon of t periods so t periods basically can be viewed as days so if you have uh in the context of india they were selling their produce for a period of 5 or 6 months so the capital t will be will be basically uh 150 days in that case the farmers can sell their produce either to the government at the support price s which is already pre announced or to a outside agent or a trader at a unit price w which is strictly smaller than the support price s the farmers incur a uh, holding cost every day they hold their produce and also incur a discounting factor alpha so here discounting factor is basically taking into account the interest rate bo borne by the farmers if they hold if they get money in some future time okay the government has a random procurement capacity in any period uh, t so given these farmers are going to make decisions every day every period in terms of how much quantity they are going to sell to the government and how much quantity they are going to sell to the outside agent or a trader they are making these decisions in order to maximize the amount of profit they can make over the entire horizon of their produce 
So the main result that we show is, is that farmers are going to operate a, a sell down to policy in which in every period, if they have this much produce, they are, going, they are going to observe how much is the capacity of the government and they are going to sell as much as possible to the government because government's pr price is always higher, right? So they are going to bring their quantity to, to this much amount. Now, after this, after this activity, they are going to, uh, they have two options. They can uh, either sell the entire quantity to the outside agent at the, at the price W or they can hold some of it for selling to the government in the future. And these decisions are basically making the following trade-off. If, if they sell the entire thing to the outside agent, they are selling the produce at a lower unit price, W. Whereas if they hold this produce to the future periods, they, they are making higher revenue from selling to the government at a higher price. But at the same time, they are incurring holding cost they are also incurring the discounting because of the interest rates. So balancing these trade-offs, we find that in every period, they should bring their inventory down to some threshold V and, uh, and they should, beyond that, they should hold for the future selling periods. Okay. So given these, uh, Given, given these decisions, we can quantify the amount of distressed sales as the total quantity sold to the outside agent. And we can show that how does this quantity change with the model parameters. So the first thing that we show is if the farmers incur a higher holding cost, they will be more inclined to sell to the outside agent because they don't want to hold it for longer time. If the cost of capital goes up, again, the farmers would want to sell more to the outside agent because again, they don't want to hold for a longer period of time. If the government support price goes up, the farmer will be more inclined to sell to the government and hold it for the future. And finally, if the agent's price goes up, the farmer would be more inclined to sell to the agent instead of to the government, right? So these are very intuitive insights of how these distress sales change with all these model parameters. The more interesting thing is now given this model, we can now quantify the impact of all these policies. Uh, specifically, if you look at this plot on the X axis, we have a percentage increase in the average capacity of the government. And on the Y axis, we have percentage reduction in the interest rate. If I increase the capacity or if I make the loans more affordable to the farmers, the farmer's welfare is going to improve, right? So both these policies are in some sense substitutes. But which of these policies is more beneficial? That is coming from the level curve here. So if you look at the level curve, which is marked as yellow, on which these two points lie, we have these two different policies. One policy suggests that you should improve the capacity by 35% and reduce the interest rates by 5%. Consider an exactly opposite policy where you, where you increase the capacity by only 5%, but reduce interest rate by 35%. As you can see, both these policies are exactly opposite in, term the, in terms of their emphasis. One is em emphasizing capacity, whereas the other is emphasizing uh, loans, affordable loans. We find that both these policies are equivalent in terms of improving the welfare of the farmers both will result in 4% uh, reduction in farmer's welfare, uh, improvement in farmer's welfare, right? So with the help of this kind of a decision-making tool, uh, policymakers can then uh, start with some targeted level of improvement and then see which of these different policies will result in that targeted improvement and then do a cost and benefit analysis. If one thing is ben more beneficial compared to its cost, then implement that policy in practice. And finally, we also look at the role of uncertainty in capacity on welfare. So on this, in this plot, on the x-axis, we have the average capacity. And on the y-axis, we have the, the contribution of uncertainty on the welfare. So what we show is that when capacity is the bottleneck on average, 
uncertainty does not play much role but if capacity is not a bottleneck then uncertainty can improve welfare by as much as 10% so as a policy maker if i know that my capacity is good then if i want to still improve my improve the welfare of the farmers i should make it more certain and i will get a benefit of 10% from that so to summarize um what we have done in this paper is we have built a tractable model that captures all these ground realities and we have in doing so we have provided a useful decision making tool uh which can be used to um inform policy making um that's all thank you very much in your uh, introduction you have said several factors that influence decision of the farmer to sell or not to sell mm -hmm. so all those factors are not included in your model okay but your model is going to be sensitive to those factors uh can you be more specific which factor you are talking about say for example farmer a has a goat or a, or a cow farmer b has nothing so the decision to sell or not to sell also includes for farmer a whether he can get rid of the cow and keep the so that is uh your model is sensitive okay let me other external factors correct correct so in our model we are taking a a macro level uh, approach where we are looking at a farming community instead of uh, individual farmers um so specifically as you just said if there are two farmers um one farmer has a larger amount of produce he is a big farmer compared to the other farmer then the other farmer is anyway disadvantaged because this farmer is going to capture most of the market by going again and again to the marketplace and selling and selling its produce right this other farmer because he is a small farmer he does not have that good market access so he will be more exploited by the traders compared to this big farmer the big farmer will uh, just flood the market when that small farmer is uh, uh, selling and so he might be the the merchant the the, the buyer at one time and be the seller on the other time so correct that also so I, my question is is there any sensitivity analysis uh we do not do that uh, in in this paper but definitely it's uh, something that is uh, definitely useful and interesting for future work do we have any other question okay just a real simple question where do the agents sell their produce do they sell it to the government Yeah so typically what happens is specifically I'm talking I'm going to speak uh, in the context of India so their uh, government has licensed traders and these marketplaces are also places where licensed traders go and uh, purchase on behalf of the government correct so many of these things happen uh, uh in a informal way so even though even though those traders are supposed to give the guaranteed price that is that the government promised but there's ineffective monitoring system which will let them to again uh, purchase it at a lower price than the guaranteed price does that answer your question inefficiency, inefficiency of the system correct correct more questions okay thank you shivam thank you so now we can move to uh, marco so. thank you so much everybody so i think the both both presentations were a, an excellent segue for me i will try to combine to some extent these two narratives one coming 
from a food and beverage company at the global level with domestic operations, and the other one about a policy, a procurement policy and risk policy inside the, the corporate world. As we have heard this morning uh, with the World Bank uh, looking at the 17 global sustainability development goals, uh, and then the efforts that you know they are calling explicitly calling for companies and different businesses uh, at different levels to be part, play an active role in advancing those goals. We have seen particularly in the consumer packaged goods industry that more informed customers are for the first time asking the question of where the food that is on my table is coming from. There have been also an uptake of what it's seen as more uh, all the time fresh produce, all the time uh, fresh flowers and different things, outlets from a marketing, from a retail standpoint, sometimes at the wholesale standpoint. The reality is that there is still a lot of lack of transparency in the supply chains that are essentially producing and delivering all these different consumer goods. So I, uh, I come today to, to share with you a little bit of the lessons and things we have learned over time in the food and beverage industry. And I will start with uh, looking at some of what, what are the drivers or what are the reasons for all these companies to disclose, to be more transparent, to have actual goals in place, track those goals, and then communicate in a timely fashion any of these goals. Some of these drivers are, you know, perhaps they are any company is looking to reduce their risk or what level of compliance they are having from a manufacturing, from a sourcing standpoint. At the same time, you could be looking at, well, a lot of companies are doing materiality assessments to precisely identify which kind of products and which kind of services and also which kind of behaviors inside or outside of the company are important to them for the benefit of the business, but also now more importantly addressing or catering to this triple bottom line, what other environmental and social elements are material for this company. So that's another significant driving into the into this conversation. Now, a lot of companies are, are global uh, and therefore they tend to just cascade down global goals into domestic ones without considering the readiness of the market, the readiness of the expertise or capabilities. So that is that is one, one aspect to consider. Then, of course, companies talk to other companies. So peer pressure is a real factor in many companies. Two years ago, there was a new standard called the Alliance for Water Stewardship that was the result of many food and beverage companies as well as several global environmental nonprofits, such as the World Resources Institute, the Nature Conservancy, and, and organizations of that, of that caliber. Nowadays, a combination of different report, voluntary reporting frameworks, such as the now standards from the Global Reporting Initiative, the Sustainable Development Goals, of course, and then now the more advanced, more specific questionnaires for the former Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, as of today. Supply chain performance, of course, 20 years ago, Walmart already had in place a 12-question survey for all the constellation of suppliers. Ten years later, they realized that they will need to start looking into their actual carbon and water footprint. Well, Walmart, as big as domestic or global as they are, they realized that only 90% or, 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 or said the other way, only 10% of their environmental impact was due to them. As big as they are, as the fleet as they have, the number of stores, the number of employees, only 10%. So where is the other 90%? In the supply chain. Anywhere where all the products that we see on their shelves are coming from, from a company standpoint and, and also from the suppliers of the company standpoint. So essentially any company bearing any element of agricultural supply chain or operation has a vested interest and Walmart has a vested interest in them. At the end, industries tend to organize themselves. Why? Because if they don't, somebody else will come and set some policy for them. So then uh, how we create these so-called pre-competitive spaces across different organizations and companies. Now, all this work and all these different drivers are things that are always in the radar of sustainability practitioners and now more than ever in the radar of boards of directors and investors of publicly traded companies. Why is that? Around 18 months ago, BlackRock, that is having essentially or managing trillions of assets on behalf of all these global companies, set a letter to all the leaders of these companies explicitly addressing that the triple bottom line is here to stay. 
So it's no longer about finance, it's also about the environment and the social implications. Therefore, your procurement policy should accordingly change and evolve. What you see there, I'm sorry because it, it's kind of an eye chart, is just a detail of sustainable development goal number six. Some of those elements talk about water availability, and we, we saw this morning also its prominence to this forum in the talk from the World Bank. At the same time, we're looking at technology transfer. Perhaps many companies and many developed markets are looking into water scarcity and then water quality, but also the excess of water in terms of flooding or weather, or weather events is also a risk that companies need to manage. So on one side, you have the explicit call from the United Nations Global Compact to become more active. Now, on the other side, what has happened in terms of water stewardship inside different corporations? For the most part, their expertise and the programs they have in place have been looking at their own operations. That is a natural step because most of the control, most of the system, the trackings, the key performance indicators are always at arm's length. Essentially, anytime they want, they can check how is the performance of a bottling operation, of a canning operation, of the delivery. Unfortunately, when you try to overlay the same indicators upward in the supply chain, and especially in an agricultural setting, most of those indicators are just either non-feasible or the timelines and cadence of reporting, it, not, it never synchronizes with the financially driven quarterly, monthly, bi-monthly reporting that a regular company needs to have. On the other side, companies were looking, and, and for me personally, coming recently from a food and beverage organization, a lot of the companies were looking and, and investing heavily inside their manufacturing without knowing that, so just like Walmart, only 10% of your water footprint is embedded in the manufacturing process. So what is the other 90%? Back at the ingredient part of your value chain. In our case, back in brewery industry, back in the development and growing of hops and barley. So then we start taking a second look to our sourcing policy and the water and carbon programs and energy programs in the farming operation. Therefore, these, pro these, pro these processes not only come from a procurement standpoint, but also from a change management standpoint, because nothing that you plan will happen magically. You need to actively engage with the community. And that's something that companies were not, for the most part, prepared to do. They thought that they would just overlay, ask these questions, get them resolved, and then move on. And that's not, that's not the reality. So when all these different challenges came to the door of all the companies you see there, some of those leaders in the food and beverage companies start forming pre-competitive spaces known as also technical coalitions. And of course, they start with the same, what are your challenges inside your manufacturing operation? So one of the outcomes of this coalition is the tool that you see on the right-hand side. We call that, it's a, it's a calculation engine, we call that the true cost of water. If companies ask their plant managers about how much, how much they are paying for water, most likely the plant manager will just show the utility bill and just the, the dollars and cents on that. Unfortunately, that's not the, the true cost of water. The true cost of water comes from doing a detailed mass balance assessment. And then if that same gallon comes in and then you hit it, and then it has, therefore it has embedded energy, then you account differently for that. What happens if that same water change of state and goes to a turbine and the turbine produces electricity? How do you decouple, financially speaking, all those different elements? So that was the outcome of several companies coming together. Now, a lot of this work is essentially saving millions of dollars every day across these manufacturing supply chains, but they tend to just be relegated to operational efficiency savings. So these companies, of course, they develop the appetite to start talking about those efficiencies. So that's what you see on the left-hand side. How do you act? How do you engage? How do you communicate this to your different stakeholders? On the, on the right-hand side, sorry, you have a paper because now, now it tends to happen that these companies also have the appetite to document and formulate documents in the form of white papers that, again, in the interest of self-regulated, in the interest of be getting ahead of the curve, they are now embracing this notion of context-based indicators. So many companies are trying to be very responsible about energy, carbon sourcing policies, but they should do it considering the context of a region, considering a, a lot of the things that we just heard a moment ago, what is exactly the conditions of the market? What are the conditions that a company or the expertise that a company has in place to make that happen? 
Finally, in this section, we have on the upper side of the slide just the general framework of this new standard, the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard. It has been around maybe 18, 18 months, getting close to two years. Two months ago, both Nestle and Nestle Waters, the, that subdivision, and then PepsiCo have announced that they will aim to be AWS standard certified all their plants across the globe by the year 2025. Just in, my, in our own experience, the, the Miller Coors organization took 14 months and almost doubled our budget just to get one facility certified in the state of Milwaukee. So now if, the, if those companies are planning to certify between 45 to 200 facilities around the world, then get ready to open those, those checkbooks. The, say, the last one, it's a, it's a nascent concept, and again, please take this with all due proportion. This is coming more from practitioners and not for research-trained uh, uh, experts. So the, in the lower portion, you see a, a, a schematic that talks about the impacts, but also the dependencies at the catchment level, at the watershed level. So therefore, just from a pure corporate citizenship standpoint, you need to be aware of what is expected for you as a company. So this essentially takes us to how do we engage with the organization, not only understanding how do you manage your resources, but what elements are connected back to now emerging topics such as circularity. So just to finish up, uh, the Miller Course and the Brewing Organization has a barley program, mostly located in the states of Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. And then this program has been historically in motion for 70 years. The program is an annual contract with the growers, and the company has a research and development uh, cross-breeding program. So essentially, the, the company entrusted the seeds to the farmers. This is a snapshot of the facilities that the company has. Over time, the company discovered that the infrastructure that they had was not enough to provide the right conditions to the growers and the farming community. So then we engaged into a number of conversations with companies like Union Pacific to provide additional railroad links to the places where we source our, gra our grain. Initially, we used to truck all that into the malting house by converting all that with the, with the help of, the, of Union Pacific, we essentially reduced by 20% the carbon footprint of that segment of the supply chain. But if we go back to the general topic of, of water, the risk policy for this company is to always take care or take a, in advance one full year of grain of safety stock at a given time. What is that? Because a couple of years ago, a number of climate and weather conditions took out at least 40% of the whole supply of the company. So the, so the supply chain are, is experimenting a big disruption. Finally, how do we implement this vision into an actual and a feasible program? Well, companies are essentially willing to pay part of the solution. Any grain elevator on that schematic is around 10, 11 million dollars that these companies are undertaking on themselves. They are not asking the community to pay for them. They are not asking the government to take for them. But when it comes down to implement conservation plan or even bring technology, precision irrigation technology, then we have significant allies in the federal government. Through the Department of Agriculture, particularly with NRCS, we have tapped the resources of the EQUIP program and the RCPP program. Essentially, we provide an almost free risk rotation for the farmer. And a family that has historically grown barley is now able to rotate to a different crop. And if the overall plan, including new technology on the ground, sensors, uh, different, different instrumentation, qualifies for a conservation plan under NRCS, at the end of the season, those acres could be certified. And if so, 80% of the cost of the overall project go is reimbursed to the farmer directly. What happened to the rest 20%, companies like Miller Coors will pick the, the balance of the tab. So finally, what we're creating is just the right conditions for other companies to move forward and use just different initiatives like field to market. They are one of eight global outfits looking at what is called now the field print calculators. What you see there, it's uh, just the outcomes of a pilot that we conducted uh, with the company. And this is just a comparative diagram. This is spider diagram just takes the performance under these six indicators for your program, sometimes for your county or your state or the region as a whole. 
Now, none of this could happen if you don't have the right instrumentation, if you don't have the right incentives from a policy, from a sourcing standpoint. So companies in this specific area are not only hiring and contracting the acres of these for these grains, but in addition, are formulating new financial incentives that if a farmer is active and demonstrate via documentation and evidence, and, mo and I think most important, if those acres are certified at the federal level, that they are being uh, very smart, they are optimizing their levels of nitrogen, phosphorus, they are more effective on the water usage and irrigation, then that is something that comes along in the, per in the overall performance of the supply chain. So just in, in conclusion, companies are aware of both. The pull from the market, people want to know where things are coming from. But on the other side, for any company to be able to be transparent, to have the information in place, you need to engage on a timely manner all the actors in that supply chain, particularly for the Miller organization moving from paper records into just basic Excel sheets or maybe perhaps provide a tablet or some technology to between five to seven years. And again, any company alone can do it. As it was said in the morning, Goal, Global Goal 17 is about strategic partnerships. Most of the goals of these companies by design are meant to be achieved in partnership with others. With whom? Academia, nonprofits, the government. Both financially and also more importantly from a communication standpoint. Okay? So with that, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Before any questions, I want to express my you coming from Chicago is my friend and also thank you <laughs> bringing the industry uh, perspective uh, and integrating with the global policy so I really appreciate your presentation and your uh, participation thank you so we can take any questions if you have enjoyed the presentation. Th this morning at the earlier opening session, the speaker from the World Bank, Jennifer Serra, commented that, and if I took it down correctly, one third of food is produced as wasted. So the question really relates to this whole supply chain. Does that wastage, is that, number one, is that addressed by these food and beverage companies, and does it not in some, of, some ways negate the effects of water conservation, particularly in the water context, because that a huge amount of wastage, is there some efficiencies with supply chain and just in time or such things mm -hmm. that could reduce that wastage in water. Yes, absolutely. I, a couple of years ago, I, I uh, participated in a sustainability summit of sorts for a company called Tosca. Tosca maybe is not a well-known name, but it's most likely the third largest packaging organization around food and beverage, now with flexible packaging and pouches and other things. So their task, their main sustainability goal, and um, please consider they are a packaging company. Their main goal is not around carbon or, or materials on carbon or paper pulp. It's about reducing food waste. Now, the food waste conversation, I think, it hasn't been yet addressed by companies, depending on, on where they are. If we take just the brewing, the brewing industry, brewing industry tries to make the most of the circularity inside manufacturing as well. Case in point, spent grain. Spent grain, high protein, it will always go back to, to, food, to food cattle or back to, to pet companies. Now, a couple of years ago, Tyson Foods, as well as, as Frito-Lay, signed a contract with brewing industry to start producing kind of energy high protein bars. So it's not only for, for cattle food, but also for other applications. Now, uh, this product doesn't lend themselves for, for, for waste per se, but other products that are, again, essentially food uh, per se that goes, they suffer because of the usual cosmetic aspect and selection. So even if they comply with everything else, just because of cosmetic reasons, they could be rejected in the last mile of the trip. So that is one aspect. But then that brings the notion of how much of this responsibility should be bared by the producers and the companies, but also by the retailers. A lot of companies have this retail edit. So companies, just again, like Walmart, knowing all this information from their suppliers, they can select or pick what goes to the shelves when and where. So from that gate, that would be also a very important stage gate in the participation. I think the conversation on food waste is there, but companies, and, and, and just to finish, uh, a lot of companies, and let me put a, a very you know, simple and, and perhaps 
to some extent is relevant example, but we have seen that in a lot of companies that have these kind of conferences and cater centers. Those are huge food waste wasters. What has happened there is that companies try to collect all that food and provide it to shelters, provide it to community. Well, guess what? The legal team will come down to you and will say just from a liability standpoint, because maybe we don't have the hygiene standards of somebody or of a real organization that is dedicated to this, we can do it. So we stop doing it. But now there are a number of emerging companies in this shared economy that they will gladly take the food from corporate centers and other organizations, package in the right way in hygiene at hygiene levels and provide it anywhere you need it, legally and without cost. So unfortunately, that food waste conversation has excused itself on the liability aspect. And I think that is something that will need to be and enforce take on head on. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you again, Marco. Thank you. Uh, last presenter, Azaria Laval from the uh, School of Natural Resources. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'll be presenting on developing sustainable irrigation system in Africa, a multidisciplinary approach for solar powered center pivot. On our team, we have engineers, business and agricultural um, consultants. Carlo Siri is a business professor. Kelechi Chibuikem is an urban planner. Um, we have Jacob Monty on our team, who is the engineer, and myself, the climate specialist, and um, Tio Udigwe, who is the um, agricultural consultant. So basically, we're um, trying to ameliorate the, the issue of food insecurity by um, trying to boost agricultural productivity in West Africa. Um, but before we delve into the topic, I'm going to introduce the topic by talking a little bit about food insecurity. Globally today, sufficient food is produced to feed everybody, but people daily go hungry. Um, the Green Revolution in the 1970s, um, the Sustain Millennium Development Goal in the 2000s and the Sustainable Development Goals went a long way to ameliorate the issue of food insecurity. But today, the problem is still alive and well. Um, almost a billion people go hungry and one point something billion are overweight in this same world that we are in today. These overweight people have excessive calories, unwanted calories, and this results in overweight for them. And when we consider the, 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 the issue of food insecurity in terms of nutrient deficiency, deficiency of nutrients like vitamin A, iron, and zinc, there is um, about 2.5 billion children lack sufficient access to these essential nutrients. The impact of this is on the stunted growth and accumulated impact on the um, GDP of a country. So um, some factors that have continued to influence um, global food insecurity is growing population, which is expected to increase the demand for food by almost 100% by the mid-century. We have um, political instability and conflict, shift in dietary pattern. People no longer want to take organic vegetable, but more, um, more food dense in calories in um, dairy products and cattle and beef. Um, we also have industrialization and globalization, which some other um, authors have touched upon in this um, session. We also have food wasted, as was mentioned earlier, one third, 30 percent of global food, both at the agricultural level and at the end users level is being wasted globally. We also have the issue of climate change, which what exacerbates all the impact that is being experienced. So, so um, we are focusing on Africa because um, West Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically because the agricultural productivity in this region is dependent on rainfall, is dependent on climate. And now we have climate change. We have unreliability in the climate, which is influencing the, the, food, um, the food production and 
with a cumulative effect on the food security on this region. Um, research done by Molly and Christopher re found that cl climate determinism is not the sole determinant of food, food productivity and in effect food security, but improvement in economic, social, political and technological input would drastically influence impact upon the um, agricultural productivity of regions of the world. Um, this is um, exemplified by the mid Midwest region of the United States, where um, the largely unproductive land became one of the most productive areas of the world upon the advent of, upon the introduction of the center pivot technology. So, um, in Africa, there is a huge potential because currently the, the, there is a, a, an 80% yield gap in rain-fed maize, as was done by Patricio Grassini. In the United States, there is the, the yield is almost 80% of what they can achieve. In Brazil, the, the, the figure is around 40%, while in Africa, the current capacity is still at 20%, meaning there's going to be a 80% potential for increase for increase in production in this region and this is quite interesting because the majority of the coming population for the world is going to be concentrated in this region so this makes our project interesting and um, exciting um, so for this we to be able to close this gap we are proposing a system of solar power center pivot we are using solar power center pivot because the national grid is not reliable just like is um, obtainable in the United States. Um, as can be shown in the graphic there, there is a, spring, a basic sprinkler system which is grossly inefficient and cannot guarantee um, food production in this region. So um, our intervention is to not just feed this, the people in this region, but to be able to stimulate e e economic growth. And um, this is already um, the impact of unreliable, un unreliable climate determinism is already being felt and experienced in this region as um, during one of our, um, our travel to the field uh, to, to talk with stakeholders in the region, the Grameen Foundation specifically mentioned that um, rainfall is now erratic is no longer reliable the impact of this is shorter length of growing season and ultimately crop failures so therefore we we intend that the the solar power center pivot would be able to guarantee um, continued agricultural product production in this region however um, some of the factors considered during the design include the span the length of the span the irrigation span the land area the crop what, what kind of crop the demand by farmers and the um, crop um, the water table the aquifer table it is quite interesting that um, the aquifer the water table over there is quite high so we we need relatively lower energy to touch water and be able to um, get water for pumping we also have um, water storage, how, do we, how, how is the water stored? Um, we, the other considerations are the, like the power requirements. How do we power the system, the machine that we are proposing? Others are the tools, the gearbox, the waterproofing of electricity and the likes. So um, our design concept is to irrigate um, one acre farm because um, we, we can, currently in the United States, the average span of um, a center pivot is around, um, is around 400 meters for a 125 acre farm. But here we are concentrating on one acre farm with the intent because majority of the farmers in this region are small older farmers. So um, for our design, we, the engineering team actually worked on this and they realized they are proposing something like this for a one acre farm. Um, find, um, the, 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 this is a picture of the, what we, we are intending to produce at the end of our, our work. We will be having, they, they realized, they discovered that four 
spans of um, solar panels will be required to power the machine. And um, they took this design into the laboratory and put it to stress beyond what is obtainable on the field. And there is little or no deformation in the functionality of the system as they simulated in the lab. So um, now to the supply chain. How do we put all the system together? How do we get the solar panel? How do we get the irrigation span? Number, I'm going to start with the um, um, solar panel. Um, the, the cost of an average span is around $300. And we the, the, they've the, um, calculated and determined that the system requires eight panels. That is 2,400. Purchasing the solar panel alone is prohibitive, not feasible in this region. $2,400 is a lot of money in the local, um, in the local currency over there. So um, we identified um, a company where we could um, get the solar panel, which is the Solar World Mono Solar Panel um, that is being done in the US here. And um, the other consideration, key consideration now is the battery. How do we store the energy? Do we use a Tesla battery? Do we use a tank? All these comes with their own, um, I lack a word right now. All this comes with their own challenges, um, particularly the cost. The cost is prohibitive. While the tank idea is very, very exciting, it's going to store a lot of energy, going, but it is very, very costly, um, about $17,000 for a 30,000-gallon 30, 30, 30, tank. And for the Tesla, a smaller battery, we have uh, about 6900 and another battery source that we got was the uh, um, Discover, which is also around the same amount with the, um, with the Tesla battery. So the challenge with this is the, um, is the, is the cost at this point. And um, other challenges that we have identified in, the, identified in our research team is the security. How do we ensure that this, the, because these things, the batteries are highly valuable they are secure they they are not going to get stolen and the like so these are things considerations that we are consider um, that we have identified and are currently examining also um, in terms in terms of the research we continued and try to look for alternatives what are the alternative power source that can be used should we use um, diesel power generating sets Challenges are, oh, we are contributing to carbon footprint with that. Do we use solar power? Um, so, um, do we use wind, wind, um, wind, um, wind energy? This is also relatively costly to acquire. And we are also considering the use of overhead tank to store water. So um, in, after considering all this high cost, we are uh, now analyzed, we then went on to analyze how do we reduce the cost. Taking away the solar components would help us reduce the current cost, which is estimated f at about $20,000 to around $11,000 with the same productivity and efficiency. So therefore, the irrigation system alone would cost us around $11,000 still prohibitive. So therefore, we are cons also considering construction in Africa, sourcing parts in the United States and constructing this, putting, assembling it together in West Africa, where, the, where it is going to be deployed versus, cons um, number one, we considered fabrication in Africa. The, 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 this is very attractive because there is low cost attached to this. Labor cost is low. And there are, we also identified local players like the Zenvus who have demonstrated um, capabilities in technological driven agriculture. So we calculated what is going to cost us to source some parts in the United States, ship down to Africa and assemble it over there, which is about $21,000. Um, also, the other alternative we had was shipping the whole system from the U.S. to Africa, which is about that, that $5,000. Irrespective of how we look at this, the cost is still prohibitive. 
Um, therefore, we went ahead to think of ways we can further reduce the cost. And one of the things we thought about is share cost sharing. That is having the system being shared by two, three, four, or five farms. However, the challenge with this is breaking of the parts. It's easy. It's, go there's, it's going to be the the lifespan is going to drastically reduce because the process of moving from farm to farm is going to cause um, issues. Also, we considered having extra extra um, parts like the bolts and nuts, um, like extra span, just to ensure that the system is is sustained in the region. So, um, uh, conclusively, this is an ongoing work and is going to co culminate in my final thesis, which is going to concentrate on um, a comparative analysis of agribusiness resilience in Nebraska and Nigeria with the intent of sharing lessons from both systems to, for short-term adoption to be able to boost agricultural productivity in the region. So um, I want to conclude this by reminding us about why this is important. There is a huge potential in Africa for pr food production. There is a coming population that needs to be fed. The, the, there is the potential to feed these people if we adopt the right technology. So um, thank you. Um, our team is actually open for comments and ideas on how to make this a feasible and workable solution. Thank you. Do we have a question? Uh, <laughs> so my question is, uh, like having read a lot of articles about irrigation in Africa, it's still not even easy to adopt a uh, small um, uh, solar, solar powered pumps or diesel powered pumps. And to me, this sounds really expensive. I just want to know why you decided to work on the center pivot, not like a very small scale. Uh, technology because I still, I don't know, also my second question, question would be like, how have you analyzed the efficiency of this uh, equipment because at the end of the day, if it's uh, irrigating one acre and costs about 11,000, uh, I doubt the efficiency of the. Well, like I mentioned, this is an ongoing work. We are working actively to reduce the cost, which is the main drawback of the system. But this is also exciting because if you consider the, the, the state of the Midwest region of the United States, unproductive to become very, very productive, one of the most productive in the land through the adoption of technology, you know. So it's very, very important that we look into things like this. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, thank you. When you're designing the center pivot, do you know, did you take care of uh, the revolution? Because at night, you're going to, it rotates even at night. It can take two days to make a full rotation. And I've seen the problem with the solar system. You have to really have a backup storage of the energy. So, I mean, you're going to have a challenge in really having that energy to re la run the center pivot. I was thinking you would start thinking small. Have you thought of other, you know, applicable irrigation systems? I know you have a team of engineers, but, well, I think you've gone beyond than starting small. I would think uh, you would think of, if you want to use the solar energy, you'd think of having a drip system. You have a reservoir, a head tank, where you pump the water, and then maybe you just have that flow through gravity. So you're kind of using less energy, and then you're pumping water, but as well, you're, you're meeting the same need. It is important to note that there are variants of what you have just mentioned, like controlled flooding, gravity, um, um, use, use of gravity for in irrigation in Africa. But the question is, what has this achieved? There is still a huge productivity gap. And like I, 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 I went upstairs, I saw a, um, an, a, 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 I don't know how to put it right now, um, a graphics by AgDev company in Ghana. They are adopting irrigation technology over there. 
you know so the point is the, we have to start thinking about how to evolve with the challenges that are emerging you know because right now the, the population is going to explode really fast really soon and oh fine we want to use all this technology that you have um the smaller ways but we also have to start thinking big in order to be able to solve the complexity of the problem that is emerging so you started something yes and yeah, we are also <laughs> that my thesis is all improve yes so and my thesis improve. is also going to co um, concentrate upon learning learning from what are the lessons we can learn from nebraska nebraska is a top agricultural state what other lessons can we learn that can be used to en enhance the resilience of agriculture and back home and what can they also learn from us that because small older farmers currently are the backbone of food security in the world so definitely there are some lessons that nebraska can learn from back home okay. thank you any thank other you. questions Thank you. Uh, I'm Esther from Nigeria. This question may not be really directly to the presenter, but uh, I'm just uh, trying to open it up, you know, for comments or discussion. Uh, my experience back in my country, I'm from Federal Ministry of Water Resources, Abuja, Nigeria. The issue of energy is a very, very critical factor that we are facing in recent times. Like uh, many years ago, diesel was cheap, relatively. And some of our projects, they are being run on, on they, they, they were designed for diesel pumping. We have quite a number of them. So much has been invested. But when it comes to operation, operational cost, the farmers could not cope with uh, the funding required to do the, to use it for the irrigation. You see big pumps, diesel pumps, and they just abandon the project. So as it is, we don't want to, you know, like do away with the project. We want to see what we can still make out of those investments that we have made. And the question is, ah, are we going to do it with minimum cost possible and uh, in recent times we decided to be also looking at a uh, solar option so i don't know in nebraska nebraska here do you have a uh, what is your own uh, concentration on utilization of energy are you using fuel are you using diesel are you using solar are you using what technology or wind like in netherlands so i want to rub minds and hear some view from people so I don't really know all the statistics, but if there is any uh, expert in this panel, well, um, we can try to answer. I, but uh, yeah, I, anyone? I want to talk. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I want to let you know that I'm from Nigeria too. Okay. Yeah, and I know when you talk about power issues, I understand what you're saying. So yeah. Um, we actually considered the operational costs in the process of our research, and that is one of the reasons we come up with these systems are some, some this system, irrigation system is already existing in Africa, but most of the time the operational cost is prohibitive. But how do we integrate this? How do we make it such that the farmers is attractive to the farmers? And some of our solution is to um, collaborate with local players, stakeholders like Zenvus that has been identified in, in fabrication of some parts of the irrigation system. Um, also in terms of, um, that is, once the farmers have these parts and the, some, the, the system breaks down, they, are easy to, they can easily call on the players to fix them for them. So it's an, it's an ongoing like thinking and hopefully we can do something good with time. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you again. And if anyone wants to uh, contribute to discussion, we have 
30 seconds before lunch. <laughs> so I appreciate everyone's participation and thank you. And thanks to the presenters again. Thank you.